appreciate that. All right, well, thanks, Fred, for inviting me. Um, just so everybody knows, Fred actually asked me to do this before COVID. So it's been that long to, to get me here. Um, one of the hassles was that I used to live on 11 acres in rural Virginia with no broadband internet. So doing anything remote was pretty much impossible, but my wife and I have subsequently moved back into town. We have very fast internet, so this should all be very possible. So let me get my slide deck up. So hopefully you can see a yep. big phallic caterpillar on a leaf now. Yep. All right, so my wife and I have been married for quite a long time and she's heard me say quite a few strange things, but when I told her my presentation tonight was on caterpillar poop, I got the look. So some of you people might know what that look is. It's that sort of confusion between did I hear you correctly or and uh, what do you mean? Are you taught why are you talking about caterpillar poop? So yeah, I've been looked at that way before many times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I should also say too, Fred also told me to keep this kind of low key and informal. So if anybody wants to jump in with questions and scream in my ear and stop me at any time, feel free. And so before we get in sort of the PG rated part of this talk, let me open with a quote from Martha Weiss, who actually has done a lot of ecological research on these caterpillars that are taking care of their frass in this way. She says, although both feeding and elimination of waste are imperatives for all animals, ecologists and evolutionary biologists have devoted considerable attention to foraging while largely ignoring defecation. So she's right. So other than Gilbert Waldbauer, maybe in Illinois, looking at the amount of nutrition that was left in frass from feeding insects, we usually spend most of our time with the front end of these animals chomping, chomping, chomping away, and we kind of ignore the back end. But despite that fact, there's a lot of important things that are going on back there. And I am going to try to preface that by showing you some curated video from YouTube. Now I'm gonna to have to switch my screen. Do something else now. <laughs> so like one of the children's popular children's books, every animal does their business. So it's not strange, it's not abnormal. It's just something that's natural that happens. So now what we're gonna watch are some caterpillars actually doing their thing. And despite the voyeurism in going on here, there are some <laughs> things I want you to try to pay attention to and hopefully this video is not stuttery for you, you see it clear. But you need to watch some of the undulations of the actual external tissues that are happening while this devocation is happening. Look at that internal tissue that's actually everting from inside. It's almost like inside is coming outside right there. And then it's almost pulling that tissue back inside to release that frass pellet. Now these are, are not shooting caterpillars. These are just caterpillars defecating. This is a swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. But there's a lot of work going on back there. If you look at these hind pro legs, you might see that the crochets below, they're almost pulsating. There are incredible pressure changes happening inside of this animal's abdomen while all this is going on. It's a fairly large mass that has to come out of a fairly small opening, which isn't unusual for animals. So there has to be 
a lot of anatomy and morphology going on to make this actually happen. So it isn't really a trivial thing. These things could actually rupture and burst. One of the major issues with insects is, is desiccation, loss of internal tissues. So their, their outside envelope is wrapping up the internal liquids, keeping them moist. And they're covered with waxy coverings to try to keep all that moisture inside. So any kind of rupturing is, is kind of dangerous. So again, you can see those pulsating crochets down here. I don't know if, can you see my cursor on the screen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so down here, this is, these are the crochets of the 10th pro legs. These are pseudo legs. And again, look at these, these are internal tissues. This is the hind gut actually wrapping around this pellet. And it's actually going to push that entire hind gut area outside of its body. And then it's going to retract that hind gut back into its body, sort of scraping it off and pushing it down. And then it closes back up. So this is just how regular caterpillars do their thing, things that do not shoot them or try to get rid of them any special way. And again, here's, we've got, I think this is the hind end of a cecropia. But look at that, un, look at those undulating pseudopods. So you got to remember these caterpillars only have musculature to pull these pods back in. Ex everting them is based on internal pressures. So again, you saw that internal pressure pushing that hind gut out. And now there's sort of stabilization of pressures inside as these legs are pulsing in and out after this caterpillar has done its business. And again, here's another Cecropia doing its thing. Those crochets and or pro legs, those hind pro legs are just fanning in and out, in and out as there's pressure build up and pressure build up and pressure build up to try to get this large food, what used to be food pellet out of its body. And again, these caterpillars, they're essentially just dropping them. These are external feeders. But look at how much of that hind gut is actually extruded out of the animal before that pellet is dropped. And sometimes you'd think that with all this going on back here, these caterpillars would be sort of stopping to think about it. But most of the time, that front end is just continuing to eat. If you've ever reared, Silk moths, for example, you know, you just keep giving them leaves and keep giving them leaves and it's just eat, 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 poop, poop, poop. Well, that's kind of what caterpillars do. So now we're here, here we're looking at some caterpillars that are kind of communal, that are sort of getting a little bit of uh, potential energy on those pellets. And now we actually get to an emphalid, which is actually shooting a pellet. So now if you watch this, it's essentially the same action. It's everted, but when it pulls back, it's gonna go flying instead of just falling off. And this one's kind of had a misfire here, but most of these species of caterpillars that are doing this business, they're shooting them quite far. So this caterpillar, this is an invalid, so it's probably fairly sizable caterpillar. There it went shooting off quite a bit. Some of these caterpillars are shooting them many, many, many times their body length. The skippers that we'll look at later are shooting these pellets well over a meter away. So in addition to actually averting that pellet out, there's a lot of positioning going on there too. So we're watching these over and over again because as Fred said, my undergraduate degree was in kinesiology, which is involves analyzing a lot of functional um, movement and functional anatomy. And when you do that kind of work, you have to actually watch a lot of movement. You may have even seen where in human studies, when they're looking at movement, they'll put little buttons or lights on the body to follow where joint movements are happening. A little difficult to do that on these caterpillars. So you actually have to observe them a lot. And the reason I want to show 
a lot of this footage here is so that you can see as I've seen what this is going on because when I we're going to talk about the mechanics a little bit later from some research and you'll be able to follow it better having seen this happen repetitively. And again, these are all uh, nymphalids. You can tell the, the head capsule with the horns so far. Um, these caterpillars that have been shooting their frass are nymphalids. But there's definitely a pattern there. I'm hoping you're seeing there's a pattern. It's push it out too far pull it back a little bit and pow, almost like cocking a gun, pulling a lever back and then releasing it to let it go. Again, more nymphalid footage. Hmm. And these are multiple species. So it's not just one. This isn't really that unique of a, of a behavior. There are several species of Lepidoptera that actually do this. And of course, I didn't take this footage. I've been given the attributions up here in the top right corner. Um, a lot of this came from a person uh, who apparently likes to film caterpillars in Singapore and uh, apparently likes to take film footage of them defecating. And I think that's because it's kind of amazing to see these things shoot pellets so far. Most people would consider this kind of not normal. <laughs> so now we're looking at a, a, a quite different looking nymphalid. This is still a nymphalid, um, but it looks quite different. And this one's going to be quite forceful. And it just kind of, it kind of just disappears. Sometimes this happens so fast, it's like that pellet is there one second and then it's gone the next. Like that. So it's quite ballistic. There's quite a bit of energy involved with getting that out of there and shooting it away. And we are almost to kind of the stars of the show here for the rest of the talk. We'll get to some skippers. That's real time, isn't it, Mark? This is pretty much real time. So you're limited by the framing of the video on YouTube. So this is a skipper. Now I've taken the video, uh, the sound off of this, but when you hear these things doing it in this kind of an arena, it smacks. You can hear that hitting the side of this filter paper, and it makes a pretty hard smack. <laughs> so here, this videographer actually redid this in a loop himself. And what I'm going to have is a little bit of a close-up. And I'm going to try to show you, see if I can stop it right there. There's a structure right here sticking out of the tail end of this caterpillar that is moving and is instrumental in making this happen. And that's kind of what this talk is, is going to be about. So now let me get my slide deck back up. All right. So here was one of the, you can see the caterpillar now.
Can you see the caterpillar on your screen? Am I sharing the right screen? Yes. OK. So here's one of the caterpillars that we saw footage of. And right here, if you can see my cursor at the tail end, is this structure called an anal fork or an anal comb. And these caterpillars that can do this frass ejection and shoot them off ballistically have one of these. So what exactly is this anal comb? Well, here is a tortricid larva. Um, it's one that I have to look at quite often. It's the omnivorous leaf roller in the species is Platynotus deltana. Here's a side view from Stare, the immature insect book, showing almost the entire organism. Here's its tail end, and there's where the anal fork is attached. It's just above the anus and just below the 10th dorsal segment in a caterpillar. Here's a illustration from Stare of what that anal fork looks like. And here, is an SEM that I made last week of a, a Platynota caterpillar's anal fork. So Martha Weiss at Georgetown has looked at this in a little bit, did a bit of a survey and review, and she found that there are actually um, frass ejection behaviors and anal fork morphologies in just 17 different families of Lepidoptera. So it's quite diverse, it's quite widespread, and it's not phylogenetically limited in terms of classification. It's, it's in many, many different families. Here's another one in a species of Graphilida. This is probably the ornamental fruit moth. And this character is quite odd because it, in this stage of life as a caterpillar, is usually feeding inside the fruit of a apple or a pear, and it doesn't really push any frass around or shoot any frass around that we know about. And the reason why this is really interesting to me, as Fred said, is I actually study moths in the family Galicheidae. I actually study many Galicheoids, but my specific emphasis is on Galicheids, and a lot of Gillikids do have these, but Gillikids, unlike some of those nymphalids and skippers that we were looking at, they're not known for doing a lot of flipping of frass, even though they do have anal forks. So here's a species of Anarsia that has a well-developed fork, Hel Helcistogramma, which is a completely different subfamily of Gillikids, and Fascista, which is an Another completely different subfamily of Gallicids. They all have anal forks. They're not quite all the same. So if you look across Gallicids, there's actually some variation in what that anal fork looks like. And for some, like these two here, C and D, species of Polyhymno, they're actually very different. So as I said, not all of these caterpillars that have anal forks actually eject frass or fling their poo. So here is the red bud leaf folder. You might be familiar with this guy. It's a very pretty caterpillar. It's on Eastern red bud, as the name implies, and it folds leaves over in the late summer and early fall. And if you open those leaves up, you'll find one of these black and white banded caterpillars. But if you look in that nest, it's it's just full of frass. It's not getting rid of frass anywhere. It's actually lining its silk tube with frass, but it definitely has an anal fork. So that red bud leaf folder caterpillar has an anal fork that looks like that, which seems to be very similar to the anal forks in these two species, which are Galecchiini. And this, the, the species of the, well, the leaf folder is in a genus called Fascista, and it's also Galecchiai. So there actually could be some informative characters for trying to find the classification of these species by looking at the anal fork. And even though, uh, like a colleague of mine down in Florida, Jim Hayden, published a paper with a Korean student 
They described a new species of Gelichia down there feeding on lead tree. And they described the larva and its behavior. You can see in these larval pictures, there's no frass in any of these chambers where the silk is. And it does have an anal fork. And I did speak to Jim about this and he said it does actually frick, flick its frass. So here's a Gelichia that he has observed actually ejecting frass and flicking it out. But even though these two authors use that anal, anal fork in a picture and, you, and included it in their description of their new species, they changed the classification of this genus of Gelichiids into the subfamily Thiotrichini. And these two animals here, this is the anal comb of two other species in that same subfamily, but they couldn't use any of this information to help classify this organism. It was done completely on adult characters because there's just so little known about how many species have this because there's so little known about caterpillars. So how are they doing this? That's kind of the question. And these three authors back in 1998, two biologists and one engineer decided they were going to try to figure out how that worked, at least for one species of Lepidoptera. And the organism that they chose to study was a Brazilian skipper, which is very similar to the silver spotted skippers like we saw in the video. Here are the pictures of the silver spotted skipper from Stare. Here is that silver spotted skipper's anal comb illustrated. And here is the illustration from the Cavity et al. paper from 1998 of the Brazilian skipper. And you can see that it has an anal comb that is very similar to the silver spotted skipper that we saw ejecting grass with, with quite a ballistic action. Here's what they actually used in their study, the Brazilian skipper. And it has sort of the, in, the famous notoriety of being the incredible invisible caterpillar. It's almost invisible and see-through and transparent. So it's quite a good study organism for trying to watch this stuff going on. So what they did is they staged caterpillars in front of a camera and it was 1998. So their high speed was actually uh, 60 frames per second. So they, they couldn't get it too terribly fast, but they were able to capture these frass pellets ejecting from the hind ends of these caterpillars. And using these frames, they were actually be able to catch sequential pellets in frames to be able to calculate how fast this pellet was going at least within a certain within a certain realm of velocities. And they did it over and over and over again to try to calculate some averages of how fast and how far that pellet was traveling. They also painted dots inside the caterpillar's tail end. So this is in figure A, you're looking at the hind end of a caterpillar. The red dot, the big red dot is above the anal fork. This is the anal fork here. And then they painted a dot below the anal fork. And they did that for two reasons. One, they wanted to see, because they could see through this animal's skin, where the positions of these dots changed over time as it went through this cycle of pushing this pellet out and ejecting it. And they also did it because they wanted to see where the pellet was touching these dots when it was in different positions. As you can see down here in H, there was a dot that transferred to the fecal pellet itself. So like we were watching in the video, we sort of have, this is sort of before everything's happening. Here, you can see that the actual anal fork is being extruded. So there's movement of this anal fork, and it's not just because the tail end of this caterpillar is lifting up and down. This caterpillar can actually flex this rigid structure almost like on a hinge. And it pulls it back. The pellet starts coming out. When the pellet fully comes out, 
it gets sort of cocked like you saw in the video. And then when it's ejected, you actually see that that comb is visible again. And then it goes back down and then start essentially starts over in the pattern again. This is sort of a side view of that illustration show of what of that behavior is like. Here's the pellet. It's extruded out. And here are these pieces of tissue that we were seeing in the video. And they called them the primary and secondary torus. Torus is just sort of a generic name for a big ring, like an inner tube ring. But they noticed that when that secondary torus was extruded, the anal fork was pulled down, hooked on that secondary torus, so that when the tissues were pulled back inside, it pulled that anal fork back. So this is the resting position of the anal fork. But when this thing is cocked, so to speak, you can see that that anal fork is really retracted back with this anal tissue. But then as it keeps pulling this anal tissue back, this slips over this little ridge on the torus and essentially releases that pressure. And that's how the pellet flies out. Now I will note and show that they, they illustrate mus muscles here to show that their that anal fork can be controlled with musculature. But one of their problems with trying to hypothesize how this could be happening is that this muscle is kind of small and just does not have the force generating capability to send a pellet like this so far away or so fast. So they're already starting with the notion that this was not muscular, it had to be something else. So what they decided was that when these tissues were being pulled back, that this anal fork was holding back a plate of external tissue on the, on the caterpillar right next to the fecal pellet. And that when these internal pressures were being built up, it was building force behind that plate right here. And this, was, this plate was being kept locked by the anal comb or the anal fork. And then when it was pulled back far enough and went over that ridge of the, of the secondary torus, that that plate was unlocked and that pressure could be then translated through to the pellet, essentially pushing it off almost like a plunger or like, uh, if you all know pinball, like pulling down the plunger on the pinball machine and letting it go and it smacks that ball and it sends it into the playing field. So now I am going to get to a video of a small animation that I made. It's like a cartoony animation to try to demonstrate what that looks like. So let me just bear with me so I can get to that. All right, so can you see my sort of outlined white stuff in gray? Yeah. All right, so what I'm gonna do is just scrub through this. Hopefully you can recognize this as what we were kind of looking in that diagram. Here's the top of the end of the animal. Here's the anal fork. This is the pellet. And this is the secondary torus that's being pulled back into the abdomen. So we're sort of in the cocked phase. So if I scrub through this, as that gets pulled back, their hypothesis was that it released that pressure plate and bounced that pellet out. So if I play that in a loop for you, this was their model. All right, so let me get back 
to my slide deck. All right, there's a couple problems with their model. First, this is one of the figures that I showed you earlier and I just removed some of the black pellets off of here because the black and white pellets are showing with the pellet trajectories based upon whether the caterpillar was upright or upside down. So these white pellet outlines that you're seeing are trajectories from a caterpillar that is right side up. And if you notice, they included the rotation of the pellet. You can see that it's spinning in this sort of clockwise direction as it's traveling throughout this trajectory, which does not really fit well with a plunger piston apparatus that would be pushing it almost straight back. So, they noticed this and they addressed this and they decided that the reason why it's probably rotating that way is that it's like tiddlywinks. So if you know how tiddlywinks work, you press one of your winks down into the mat with a, a widger, a squidger, and you push down in the back end. And when it squeezes off the back end of the wink, it flips up into the air and goes counterclockwise just like this. So it's almost like shooting a tiddlywink up in the air. And they hypothesized that it was the base of the pro legs that was acting like the mat in tiddlywinks, and that's why it was getting that rotation. The second problem with our hypothesis is that in this SEM, you can see that this surface area that they're saying is slamming into this pellet is covered with mechanosensory CD. And it's just not normal for insects with those kind of sensory CD to be smashing them into things. So the, the idea that these would be essentially damaged terribly by that percussive force doesn't really sit well with their model. One of the bigger problems with their model is that it's more based on that caterpillar being filled with gas or air. Air can compress, so you can actually build up pressure and use it as force to generate velocity and, and to, to propel an object. Caterpillars are actually filled with liquid. There's no compression in liquid. So you might be familiar with those kids toys or if you go online, you can actually find directions to make these water rockets that are better than the kids toys like I used to have when I was a kid. But they're really based upon a chamber of gas that gets compressed behind this water column. And that gas is what compresses and the pressure builds up and it pushes that water column off. And that water column is what translates force into the ground that pushes that rocket off. So water is really good at translating force over great distances. So if you think of hydraulic brakes, those brake lines are filled with liquid. So if you press on the gas pedal inside the, the cockpit of wherever you are and you want to translate that force way down that tube, it, it's, it's essentially immediate, but you can't really increase the pressure of that liquid to make the press, pressure higher. The only way you can really do this is by changing diameters of, of tubes, and that's not really what's happening here with these caterpillars. The other problem with their hypothesis is that it doesn't really fit well with Newton's third law of equal and opposite forces, which if you look at their schematic, as this thing's pulling back on that anal fork, it's, it's, it has to be generating a considerable amount of force on that anal fork. 
So the anal fork is exhibiting a significant amount of force against that secondary torus. And when that force is removed by the secondary torus, that force is going to be released. So this is essentially storing potential energy, which is going to be released as soon as that torus gets pulled back in. And that creates a position and timing problem with the fact that if this anal fork is under a considerable amount of stored energy and, and force, as soon as it is relieved of that force, it's going to go someplace and that force potential is against the direct, the vector of that force is going to be essentially backwards and it's going to be going right into that pellet. So if this sort of tissue is going to be slamming into that pellet, it's going to be competing for time and space with this anal fork, which is also going to want to be slamming against that pellet. So now I can show you an alternate model. So here's essentially the same setup where you have the dorsal part of the end of that caterpillar. You have its anal fork. You have the pellet. And here, if I scrub through, we sh I'm going to show what happens when you relieve that force off that anal fork. It slams into that pellet and shoots it off like a catapult. And that accounts for the rotation that we were seeing in their, in their data. So what I'm proposing to do is essentially re -eng reverse engineer that paper from 1998 and calculate essentially the same physics that they did reversing it by using a catapult model instead of a piston model. And that's going to be the cliffhanger for this talk because I'm not going to show you those results yet because I'm going to, I have to still program a model in Python to figure out if those numbers work. So essentially what I have to do is take their data, put it into a model of a catapult with physics, and see if a, if a catapult model will explain the data equally as well, or if not better, better than the data that they got, hypothesizing a piston model. So at this point, or maybe even before, you might be wondering, well, why are these caterpillars even doing this? And for that, I'm going to defer to Dr. Weiss at Georgetown. She's the one who's done most of the, any, any really of the ecology around these caterpillars doing this. She's already written two, two good papers and I would encourage you to go take a look at those um, for why they actually might be shooting these fecal pellets away. But I will give you just a little bit of a teaser from her 2003 paper in where she did an elegant study where she replaced frass pellets for skippers she, she replaced frass with glass pellets in nests of skippers. And she found that at least this predator, Polistes fuscatus, which is a wasp, was more likely to find and visit shelters that, that had frass than ones that only had glass beads, suggesting that these caterpillars might be ejecting this frass as somewhat of a defensive mechanism to uh, avoid predation. But again, the reason I'm looking at this is because not all the guys that I study that have anal forks are shooting their frass. So for me, it's more about a functional anatomy thing. And I want to, I want to know how it works, who has what, what they look like and see it and 
try to find out if I can use that as a character to, to do classifications and look at the evolution of this character over the lineages. So that's really all I have to show you for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to thank some people that were help, that helped me and gave me some inspiration. Jim Young, who I hope you guys all know, he's part of your society. And uh, he let me use their ESEM, Bench ESEM, and gave me some literature things. Martha Weiss, who did some a lot of the ecology for these animals. John Lill, you might know, who has given me caterpillar specimens and has given me information from the field. And of course, I'd like to thank the authors of the 1998 paper for taking the time to generate the data and uh, give me, giving me some inspiration for a puzzle to try to solve. So thank you. And if anybody has any questions, go ahead and let them fly. I will try to answer them as best I can. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mark. It was interesting. I can't say I've ever heard of any talk like that. Um, and I had a, a couple of questions. Um, the uh, the Polistes wasp you mentioned at the end, visit the, the 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 shelters with the glass beads more than the frass, or no, it was less than the frass, right? Yeah, it's if the opposite. So if if there's frass in the nest where the caterpillar is, the wasps are more likely to find them. So cleaning then, their what, nests out seems to it suggests that cleaning their nest makes them safer. Makes them safer. Okay, gotcha. Okay. Um because some of the competing the hypotheses are that uh that there some of the, the original hypothesis proposed for removing frass from these shelters is that they wanted a clean environment to keep uh, bacterial and fungal infections rampant. So a clean house is a healthy house was the idea, but at least in Dr. Weiss's work, she didn't really find that that was uh, an issue for at least one species of skipper. Right. Okay. Um... You had a slide that showed 17 families that were known to eject their frass like that. Um, I was just trying to remember the uh, the butterflies. Uh, you had nymphalids, you had Hesperidae, and there was something else I thought, but um, I can't remember which they were at this point. But um, I can get that one. But anyway, do you recall? No, but I can okay. get it back open and look at those names if you'd like. If it's not too much trouble. Nope. And meanwhile, if anyone else has questions to ask, please feel free. Let's see, butterflies. Just those. Hesperides, pyarids, pyarids, nymphalids. Okay, pyarids. Okay. That was the other one, right? Yep. Okay. And it looks like the nymphalids are uh, several subfamilies because you were showing Ceterinae, the Mycolesis is Ceterinae. And um, then you had Castor. And um, <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you for that. So, so they've worked out the mechanism for all this. And um, I, I was really surprised that, that as you said, in, in some of these species, it's ballistic, actually. I mean, they really fling it quite a long ways, which was it, surprising. That it's really far. They actually uh, generate quite a bit of force and so with the model that they came up with in 1998, they, they calculated that the internal pressure that would have to be exerted on that pellet would be about what's called pulse pressure, which is the difference between human pulse pressure, which is the difference between the 120 and 80 
Um, so it was about 50, 50 millimeters of mercury is the pressure that they were talking about, which is not a lot of pressure, um, but you're talking about it being exerted over a not, not a big area. But again, the problem is that unless you're using hydraulic pressure to store spring energy in the exoskeleton of caterpillar, translating that pressure quickly is, is the hard thing to do with liquid. Mm -hmm. Now, what becomes of the comb later on when they become an adult? Is that lost like many other structures in the caterpillar are lost? Yeah, yeah. In when, metamorphosis? Yeah, they don't even have an anal comb at, as pupae. Okay. Yeah, so when they pupate, um, they're, they're, the pupils, exoskeletons, don't have anal combs. It's completely a larval structure. I see. I uh, guess I'd have to say that um, this kind of puts the uh, skipper caterpillars in the same class as uh, gold metal shock putters, eh? Yes. <laughs> yeah, there was the, it's amazing. Like I said, if you go back and find those videos on YouTube and listen to them with sound, it's really a clunk. And I have uh, spoken to people who have reared tortricids. And if they have their containers nearby where they're working or sitting, they hear that little plunk, plunk, plunk sure. from those containers. So it's not negligible. It's, uh, it's, it's not just, okay, I'm getting it out like any other caterpillar. It's, I'm going to get this way away. I'm going to shoot this far away. About uh, 60 to 80 times their body length. I think uh, in this in the Brazilian skipper that they studied, I think they had them up to a meter and a half. Meter and a half. Well, that's probably well more than a hundred times their body length. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they are Herculean out effort. Yeah, and of course they had to do the typical physics stuff where they couldn't really calculate wind resistance and the def deformation of the of the pellet. Those pellets are pretty hard. And at, and at those scales, um, it doesn't have to be super, super hard to avoid being deformed. But you've, you've probably seen video of uh, golf balls or something being hit by a club. That, that ball definitely deforms. Um, so that, right. yeah, they're, they're assuming this pellet's not deforming that much. Hmm. But to me, the catapult really makes a whole lot more sense that it's it's essentially cocking this comb like a like a catapult and releasing that and that's what's shooting that pellet off and so those are the calculations that i really i want to make to try to see if that physics translates well for a catapult model it's going to be slightly complicated so is there because... any reason? sorry go ahead Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just thinking back to the uh, clean nest thing we were talking about before. Um, these who fling it away, then, uh, is there any uh, reasons that are presented why? You said look at Martha Weiss's work, but, you know. Yeah, just well, what you... so, so uh, Martha Weiss has works a lot on, on what's called concealed feeders. So these are caterpillars that either uh, silk a nest together, or build an enclosure, or they're um, burrowing into something, they're inside. So they're not just sitting out on a leaf, but not all concealed feeders um, eject frass, even if they have an anal comb like the ornamental fruit worm and some external feeders that don't have shelters do have an anal comb and they do shoot frass. 
But like I said, very few people are looking at this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not the it's not the important. And most of the time when we're talking about caterpillars, we're talking about what do they eat? And how many different kinds of things do they eat? When do they eat? How much do they eat? But very little is spent on the other end. So there's not a lot known about that part of the biology of these animals. But at least for uh, in Dr. Weiss's work, she did not find that there was an uh, any difference in survivability or viability or health of silver spotted skippers, um, whether they were surrounded by frass or not. And she, so she did three, there were three prongs to that study. She was looking at three things. One was essentially the cleanliness notion was being essentially is being around frass unhealthy. The second one was, um, is there a crowding issue so that if you just were accumulating frass the entire time you were inside of a shelter that you would eventually run out of space, you'd eventually run out of surface area of, to feed on, on a leaf, and you need to get rid of the frass so you're not essentially uh, pooping where you eat, so to speak. And she found that neither one of those was supported by the data that she collected. She made caterpillars rebuild their nests and over and over again and that was not a detriment to their health they were just as viable even if they had to rebuild and rebuild their nests and she also found that they weren't any unhealth they weren't any healthier or unhealthy by being uh surrounded by frass or not the only data that she did accumulate that seemed to support that a notion of frass removal was the predation by the wasp that the caterpillars that uh, did not have frass around them were less predated by these wasps. So it's just a little bit of data to try to help maybe tell the story of why um, most of these caterpillars are probably being parasitized by microhymenoptera more than they are predated upon by other other insects or birds even. So it could be that those microparasitic hymenoptera that are trying to find them as hosts could be using their frass as a, a chemical smell to locate the nest as well. So that would be that would be something that somebody could test. All right, we have a, a question in the chat box. Is the host plant negatively impacted from the lack of fertilizer? My son would like to know if there are any videos that show the entire trajectory of the frass. I don't know if the host plant is negatively affected by the frass. Most insects feeding on plants are considered a detriment of some kind, even if they're not a huge detriment. They, they usually aren't considered uh, contributing in that sense. So I don't know if they're providing a nitrogen source for fertilizer for the plant or not, or whether they're not doing that by keeping it in their tunnel. It's a good question, but I don't know that anybody's ever looked at that. And as far as I know, um, I don't know if there's any video that shows the entire flight of of the pellet. The, it would be cool to it would be cool to have, but the problem is, there's the caterpillars are actually small, so you're t these videos are being shot with uh, mag magnified lenses. So if you panned back to see the whole thing, you wouldn't be able to see the pellet at all, because if that pellet's going to travel a meter, and that caterpillar is only a, a I don't know, 10 centimeters long, and that thing travels a meter, you wouldn't see the pellet at all flying because you'd have to be back so far to see where it would land. You'd need multiple cameras or like they do in sports sometimes where they have those cameras up on the cables if you could make a little miniature one to follow that pellet around, but that would be hard. <laughs> it's hard to get, it's hard to film them at all, let alone try to follow a pellet in flight, but that would, that would be pretty fun need a jumbotron we need something it's the 
the the challenge of scale for insects is always a problem is for imaging and and observing they're so small and they're so complex that we always have that challenge of scale with insects okay any more questions anybody Fluorescence and lights, okay. Yeah, if we could get a fluorescent marker in their diet and do it in a black light with high speed film, I could see, yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> I could see how that could be done. It'd be a little dot, but you'd be able to you'd be able to amplify it if you had the right lighting. You'd be able to see a little fluorescent blob flying through the air, I would think. That'd be fun. You could I'm certainly assuming that's either. what you meant. <laughs> I'm sure you could see how far they went if you put a white sheet down underneath of them if they were feeding on a plant. You know, you could see where it lands anyway. Yes, you can. They're fairly directional when they're shooting. They don't just they're not like springtails where they pop and they you don't know where they land. These guys, if they're pointing a direction, that's probably where that pellet's going to go. So you can find out where it lands. but. Uh, Mm -hmm. but marking it with a fluorescent dye that that'd be kind of interesting to try <laughs> all right anyone but, else have something they want to add or Ask. Just uh, to say thank you for your presentation. It was kind of interesting watching the films. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, like I said, Fred, to keep, Fred said keep it low key. So I don't know if you can get any lower than than insect poo. <laughs> that was quite good, actually. We enjoyed it, and the videos were real nice. Yeah, so it's fun to look at pictures. Mm -hmm. I would have never imagined that, uh, you know, a studies like this have been undertaken either. That's uh, unusual. But I can see, you know, especially with the, uh, the SEMs looking at the, the parts of the anatomy that are involved here, I think that's rather fascinating that these structures exist and um, how they play a role in, in doing all this, like the comb and all that stuff. Um, how difficult is it to uh, create the SEM images? Uh, getting the images isn't terribly hard, but having specimens that retain their shape that they would have in life is hard. So caterpillars, like I said, they're, they're wet, they're moist, they're essentially bags of liquid and when you put them in an SEM, they get dry. So you have to, you would have to critically point dry them in order for them to retain their shape. Otherwise, they'll just deflate and start and start bending. Did you ever know Eric Irby down at the uh, USDA that did cryo freezing and of then he did SEMs with uh, after cryo freezing specimens and. Uh, they used it for mites, and they saw structures that they never imagined existed. Yeah, well, I know, I know Gary before he passed, and Ron, of course. Mm -hmm, Ron, yeah. They're working. They're doing a lot of the cryo SEM, and right. we have a new guy there now, Andrew Jansen, who mm -hmm. hopefully will be doing a lot of that stuff. Yeah, but I've been I've been out at the the center there, and I've used the the cryo SEM myself. Okay for uh um phylloxerids aphids mm -hmm. okay so you're very well aware of that then you still shadow cast the specimens the same way for for what you're doing with these uh combs and whatever structures that you've showed us no those were all on a bench esem so those were not sputter coated those were just put in wet and you get them in there, you do them fast before they get uh, too much uh, 
conductivity on the surface and get them out and try not to burn them. So mm -hmm. the goal there is to is to uh, just try to get it done fast. And that bench ESEM has, actually has a, a cold plate on it. So for there, you have to get a tip. So these caterpillars are usually in ethanol. You got to get them out of the ethanol. And the, for the imaging that I did, I actually took structures. So I cut the structures off, put them on the stub, and then you have to kind of get them dry enough that when you get them on the cold mount, they don't just crystallize up. Because if, if you don't get rid of the excess liquid, you'll just essentially be looking at an ice ball. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. That's the whole another realm too. I guess manipulating and learning how to use the, the samples properly and make the images. So, yep. Um, right yeah, there. and for me, it's a uh, since uh, I'd like to look at these structures in three dimensions. So, I, I confocal microscopy might be an option, but ultimately. I might have to be building models by hand because I, I build structures, uh, insect structures by essentially by hand with, not by hand, it's digital, but it's a, it's a 3D modeling program where I build structures in three dimensions. And I think hmm. ultimately that's where we're going to be going with insects, insect morphology once we get the micro CT and nano CT um, equipment accessible and cheap enough and high enough resolution. So for Lepidoptera, butterflies, moths, dorsal habitus shots of uh, wing patterns will always be valuable, but ultimately for things like male and female genitalia, which are usually ultimately what we need to do to tell species apart, will probably have to be represented by 3D models of their genitalia. And we're just not quite there yet with that technology, but it's going to be, I think we'll get there in another 20, 30 years and people will be going online and looking at genitalia that they can spin around in space 3D instead of looking at uh, just pictures of the whole bug. You think 20 to 30 more years still for that? I, I would, I hope, I hope it's within that time frame. It's, it's hard because... For big organisms like vertebrates, you can do it now. You can mass scan things in a nano CT and a micro CT. If you have access to them, they're expensive and not very many people have them. But they're trying, they're finding ways to mass digitize big things like fishes, for example. So um, investigators are taking fishes, putting them wholesale in, in big tubes and putting them in these scanners and scanning dozens and dozens of specimens all at one time so they can get a lot of data from one run of the scanner. But it's still an, an incredible amount of processing time to segment out all those structures. So hmm. right now it's a lot of processing time on a computer and a lot of uh, expensive equipment time for a piece of equipment that not very many people have. Um, but there are companies like Brooker who are selling desktop little 3D scanners, but they're really only good for doing full body scans of larger, at least insects. So you could take a big beetle. You take a big beetle and put it on a, a Brooker scanner and get a pretty good scan of a, of a full beetle. But if you want to look at the genitalia of a micro moth, not so good. Wow. Well, okay. But we're getting there. Thank you. Okay. Well, Mark, thank you very much. Appreciate you uh, giving us this lecture tonight. Um, and we can applaud or put reactions on the screen, whichever. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you also. We yeah, appreciate that. So, um, and with that, if no one else has any questions, I guess we can uh, call it a night and 
Mark, thank you again and happy Thanksgiving. Hope you enjoy and uh, hope to see you sometime, maybe down at the museum or something. Yeah, the uh, things are getting back to a little bit more to normal at the museum. I'm not there every day, but I'm getting going there more often and uh, may have to start getting back into a normal schedule of actually going in. Have they finished the construction in the back area? All that was under construction.